This is Cantus Firmus, Kingdom Theology for Christians Without a Country. Greetings, you are listening to and or watching Cantus Firmus. My guest is E. Randolph Richards. He's the author of actually a number of books, but two books in particular that, that, uh, that I read and found really interesting, which were Misreading Scripture with Western Eyes and Misreading Scripture with Individualist Eyes. Actually, I'll say co-author of those books. Um, and uh, so we're going to, I think, talk more about uh, Individualist Eyes, but um, both of the books are really relevant to, um, just kinda, they're on a similar theme and they're really relevant to being able to understand Scripture um, when we're looking at a different time, a different place, a different kind of culture, and getting over some of those, those barriers. He's currently the pro provost and professor of biblical studies in the School of Ministry at Palm Beach Atlantic University, and soon to be the research professor of NT. And that's actually really fun to be a research professor, because I, I hear that sometimes when you're a professor, you get into it because you want to do the research and the study, and then you end up uh, doing a lot of other stuff that you don't like as much. <laughs> anyway, but... I, I appreciate you taking time to be here. Sh should I call you E. Randall for? Or, or no, Randall? just Randy is fine. Okay, great. Randy, thank you so much for being here. So the, the book title, the new one, Misreading Scripture with Individualist Eyes. Um, can you define these terms, individualism and collectivism? And, and then um, tell, tell me maybe where, if we're, we're both Americans, where do we fit on that scale between the two? Sure, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, Somebody asked me one time, how do you know if you're an individualist? And uh, so I asked some other folks, and uh, here's the best test I found so far. If you would want your parents to pick your spouse, then you're a collectivist. Hmm. So if you say, oh, uh, no, then you are soundly an individualist. So it's interesting. There was a European sociologist who did a study of, I don't remember how many cultures, 70 or something, and did a scale from most individualist over to most collectivist. And so it really is a sliding scale, you know, that sort of thing. But then in his study, he found, okay, collectivist here, individualist here, but there were two cultures that were that far again out to the end. So they were off the screen individualist. Hmm. And he found out if I, if I use those two, if I include those two in the scale, that it ends up making everybody else look collectivist. <laughs> well, those two cultures were the U.S. and the U.K. Oh, so wow. we are not just individualists. We are uber individuals. We are so individualist. We make everybody else in the world look collectivist. That's how much we are. Now, let me say this because I also use the term Eastern and Western. I'm, I, you know, my first book, This Reading with Western Eyes, that was not a bash the West book. I hate those. Um, mm. I think the Western church was a gift from the Lord to the world. There's so many things that we do well. It's not that one is right and one is wrong. It's more like two wings of an airplane. I would not want to argue which wing is more important, but they are different. And so... Uh, they're different in the sense of apples and oranges. You know, they're just very different. Yeah. And so, um, you know, for instance, there's things, because I'm a Westerner and because I'm an American, there's certain passages in scripture, Cody, that I read really well. I read uh, commands of Jesus about generosity, commands about forgiveness, and, uh, and my culture helps me to do those really well. Hmm. Um, I can remember a um, friend in another culture saying, I mean, it, I mean, Americans forgive like that? And I said, well, you know, we don't necessarily. He said, so are you guys still mad at Japan over World War II? And I thought, you know, most Americans probably are not mad at Japan over World War II. He said, wow, in my culture, it's at least seven generations. Hmm. And uh, we would talk about our blood spilt. Um, and so it's, it's just a very different culture. On the other hand, there are verses in scripture that I either struggle with or, um, I don't even see them. So that's kind of the, uh, a little bit of the point. Yeah. And you know, it's, it's, when you talk about, I like the example you gave of, of marriage as the test 
um, because it makes me think of every Disney movie where there's like an Eastern that takes place in an Eastern culture where nevertheless the, you know, the, the, the daughter or whatever is, is upset because she can't marry who she wants to or live her own life, which, which seems a little bit foreign to the context of, of, of the, for the film, you know, is supposed to be taking place. Well, uh, Cody, actually, my Eastern friends are very offended by that because they would say, first off, no one loves you more than your parents. Yeah. And so I have never seen examples where a parent made a child marry someone they didn't want to. Mm -hmm. Instead, the way it would often work is the, the, for instance, the daughter would go to the parents and say, you know, Jimbo over there is pretty darn cute. <laughs> and the parents would say, hmm, yes, he is. And then they would look at his family and their values. And, and if it was just going to be a train wreck, they would say, you know, John Boy over there is pretty cute too. Or if it was like, no, that's a pretty good fit. They would say, well, we think Jimbo is a good pick. Would you like us to talk to his parents? Mm -hmm. And she would say, well, you know, that would be kind of nice. And so they would talk. And if Jimbo thought she was pretty darn cute too, um, then they would arrange kind of a date or something. Instead, we have to do all kinds of crazy things in our culture for the poor girl to get the, the attention of Jimbo or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, it, everything ends up having to fit into the Cinderella story. Mm -hmm. So she has to be pursued you know, every, every girl in America wants to be pursued, but actually only by one guy. All the others are creepy stalkers. And so the poor guy is trying to figure out, okay, if I try to pursue her, am I going to be the creepy stalker guy or am I going to be the Prince Charming guy? You know, I mean, if you think about it, carrying a shoe around and knocking on everybody's door is kind of creepy. But, you know, it's the Cinderella story. So everybody in America, when if you talk to somebody who got married and ask the wife how they met, when she tells the story, it's going to sound a whole lot like Cinderella. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, you talk about I mean, really having your parents participate in that process in the way that they do in the East is, is kind of like a checks and balances. You think about how many marriages end in divorce. And, you know, I, I'm sure you, like me, have seen people get married and thought quietly to yourself, those people should not be getting married. This isn't going to work out. But they're led by their feelings and they're not getting solid advice from people around them. I, I, I almost like imagine... Like it'd be an interesting test to see, like if you could, if you, if you just maybe ask people, if you could, uh, if a computer, a computer program could pick out the perfect person for you, would you want it to happen? Would you want to go with what the computer program said, or would you want to do it by yourself? And I think that that, like you said, that sort of pursuing and the game of it and the chase is part of what you know that the Cinderella story. I think is part of what what Americans want. And I think we, we don't really want the perfect person. We just want the person that's the most exciting, maybe. So that, that's 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 a really fair point of you know, um, why, not necessarily why the East is superior, but why there is something that it has going for it that we don't. Well, and you just go back two generations and uh, American churches helped a whole lot. Mm. So um, if you didn't find someone that was a good fit in your church, the sweet little old ladies in your church would talk to the sweet little old ladies in a neighboring church. <laughs> and, uh, and they would, you know, so... Now, it's kind of interesting. I think the modern popularity of Match.com and these other dating sites is, in a sense, trying to help people out. The sad thing is that the people who know you the best, um, you know, we, <laughs> my, my Asian friends would say, so the parents aren't involved in that? I would say, no, not usually. And they would say, don't they love their children? Mm. <laughs> and we don't think that's a... That's the question. It's fine. Well, and, and there's an example that, that I thought of when you talked about how kind of an apples and oranges and, you know, the two wings on the plane, um, where the Asian parents would say, you know, don't you love your kids? I've also heard of this practice that some Japanese corporations have somebody who sits on the board who's supposed to be the American. And what their job is to do is to criticize and raise questions because the, the Japanese culture is so much that you kind of go along with the, what the leader says. You don't want to make too many waves. And they sort of decided that that could be a bad system when you have a leader who's making mistakes. <laughs> um, well, I, I want to say it's the East is not better than the West. Someone should write a book, Misreading Scripture with Eastern Eyes. I just can't write it. Yeah. And so uh, we want to go back to what, uh, you know, Jeremiah said, the heart of man is exceedingly wicked. Or just, you know, as Paul says, for all have sinned. There is no culture that is not touched and impacted by sin. So there is no culture that's better than the other. They're just different. And, and, and maybe in short, I think we gave some examples, but um, 
that, that, that's very Eastern to give examples, but not a definition. What, what, what would you do? How would you define individualist versus collectivist? Because I don't know if we gave a clear definition. Individualist is... Well, okay. So, Cody, here's the interesting thing. The more, the more deep down a value, the harder it is to define. Mm. So I was serving in Indonesia as a missionary, and I, I had this student who really, basically, the student just needed to toughen up, you know? And, uh, and, I, and I was going to say, you need to toughen up. And I suddenly realized, I don't know the word for that. Hmm. So I started asking some of my uh, Indonesian friends, some of them who were even fluent. I said, what's the fluent in English too? I said, what's the Indonesian expression for toughen up? They said, that is one of the most confusing expressions we know in English. Hmm. Um, and so when I started asking my American friends, well, how would you define it when someone is, is tough? You know, because you can have a delicate and feminine woman, you know, who's just the the quintessential element of, say, Southern ladylike gentility or something, and she can be tough. Mm -hmm. So, so when I asked them, how do you define that? They'd say, well, it's it's you know, it's kind of this and it's kind of that. And what's interesting, the when they would start defining it, they'd switch to metaphors. You know, it's like having grit. You know. I think, well, grits a you know, that's the, and so every expression they used was another metaphor. And that's because the deeper down the value goes, the harder it is to explain. Mm. So one of the challenges when you say, well, what makes you an individualist? Bing, 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 bing. It, that, it just really doesn't quite work that way. It, but to, to make a shot at it, it's how do you define yourself? Where do you find your identity? Do, do you define yourself by I? So we would say, introduce yourself to the group. Well, my name is such and such. I work it here. I do this. And, mm -hmm. and we say all these things that we do to introduce ourselves. And what's interesting, those things are often the most transitory elements. We mm -hmm. can switch jobs. You know, we can even switch spouses. We, you know, we can move to a new location. And my uh, collectivist friends would never define. I have been places where they have been telling me about who they are and we'll get 10 or 15 minutes in it before they ever tell me their name. Hmm. Isn't that funny? They're, they're interested in their family backgrounds and, and things like that, that where they belong. So belonging is more of a, how they define, get their identity from. They would say that, uh, yes. And Cody, if you think about it, when you define who you are, if you described the culture you grew up in, the church tradition you grew up in, all those kinds of things. And you did a lot of that in many ways. We would know more who you are than for you to say, I'm Cody Cook and my job is such and such. Yeah, that's a good point. Well, and, and, and as I think about it, you know, defining yourself based on yourself and your accomplishments versus defining yourself based on your kind of group identity or where you belong, um, there's a part of me that thinks, well, that individualism sounds really lonely, but also collectivism sounds like it could be really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a, your kind of identity becomes sort of subsumed in a group, right? You know, when I think of collectivism, um, I, I think of these cultures too, but, but I, I think of like more extreme political collectivism, like the Soviet right. Union or Mao's China. And I think, well, that sounds terrible to not have yes. your own identity where the individual doesn't matter, only the group matters, right? Um, so everything, it, the world is sinful. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of positive things about individuality. Um, but it can lead to loneliness. Yeah. It can lead to striking out on your own, that sort of thing. Um, there are many challenges with collectivism. It can end with really having your own personal desires just squelched. Um, you know, it can be, it, it can lead to... Uh, uh, being less resourceful, less aggressive. You know, they when they have proverbs, the tallest plant is the one that, like, mm. the tallest blade of glass grass is the one that gets cut off. Yeah. You know, those kinds of things. So you don't want to stick out would be their point. So there are negatives as well. But you know, to take this to the biblical text, the place where it impacts us is um, the. I will say the most important things in a culture go without being said. Just mm. like we don't have to talk about how youth is important. We don't have to talk about how efficiency is important. Um, those just go without being said. So we could tell a story and I can say, you know, I think we ought to change the company this way because um, it would make it more efficient. Everybody's great. And I don't have to make a case why that's better it, because the value just went without being said. 
Hmm. So the problem is often the underlying value or the most important point in a biblical story just goes without being said hmm. uh, because the people they were writing to, everybody knew that. And so what happens is we can miss the main point. Um, the, in the story of Joseph and the coat of many colors, the first story they tell us is he rats on his brothers. Well, for us, you know, we kind of brush that off. It's just, well, that's the way kids are, you know. Um, but they were trying to set up a certain uh, story. And a lot of things went without being said. You know, I tell my students, well, you know, uh, Joseph was the oldest son. And the ones who know their Bible say, no, he wasn't. I'll say, yes, he was. They'll say, no, he wasn't. And they'll start naming the other mm -hmm. sons of Jacob. And I'll say, ah, but Joseph is the oldest son of the second wife, mm. the favored wife. Mm. And so the code of many colors was not that Joseph got the best Christmas present. It's he's indicating which wife will have the line of inheritance. So what do the other sons inherit? nothing unless joseph is going to share with them so then when they tell us the next story joseph said you know i had a dream everybody else is going to bow down to me okay well that's that's indicating pretty much the way the inheritance is going to go hmm. um i mean he could easily enslave the other brothers they could become slaves in the household rather than sons of the other wife in the household hmm. all of that went without being said so suddenly, Cody, instead of these brothers being awful, awful people, I, I will ask church members, what would you do to defend your children? Because all of these sons are adults. All of them have families. If suddenly their children are at risk, hmm. what would they what would you do to defend your children? Changes That's, the story. It does. Yeah, it really shifts kind of how we think about Joseph. Um there's another story that comes to mind. I think that you, I think you guys told in Western Eyes, um, I believe it was from in that. Correct me if I'm wrong about the um, um, the prodigal son. How uh, how the prodigal son is read in Western cultures versus how it's read in Eastern cultures, and how you can read that parable uh, at a class full of people. And if you're in the West, you ask them to recount the important details, and then you're in the East, you ask them to recount the important details. The Easterners always note one detail that we forget. And I imagine a lot of my listeners probably don't even know which one I'm talking about until I say it. And then they'll have to go look it up to make sure that I'm not lying, which is that there's a famine, right? So we read that culture from individualistic Western eyes and we say, well, what he, what the, what the prodigal son, the reason he suffered was because he did, he did the wrong thing. And it's about his just desserts for uh, not being thrifty, for not taking care of, not, not being, uh, making good financial decisions, Right. Um, but what the Easterner says is, yeah, sure, that happened, but also there's a famine. And that's, that's you know, we don't think of these sort of um, situations that, uh, like, natural disasters and stuff as, as a significant because they don't shift our fortunes as much. We live in this Western culture where we think that the de our decisions we make are much more important for our outcome than these sort of things that are outside of our control, right? Right. We, we always predict the future as so stable, mm. you know, so... From this point on, the stock market is going to be stable. Inflation will be stable. So we never predict in our plans, we never have the stock market plummeting, inflation going to 8%, that sort of thing. And, mm -hmm. and in reality, reality doesn't work that way. But the more interesting thing, I, I'll ask my students, what does the word prodigal mean? It's an English word. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, um, sinful. I'll say, well, sort of. It means wasteful. Mm -hmm. And what he's wasting is a, is a third of the family inheritance because the older son gets two thirds, the younger son gets one third. They do that to keep the estate from just unraveling into nothing. So when he sells his third and leaves, everyone left now has a third less land, a third less crop, a third less resources than they had before. So he goes out and then he wastes the money. So in our mind, if he had gone out and made it big, then it, it would be a different story. So it's only because it went sideways and a famine came even and he lost his money. That's the only reason that the story ended badly. Yeah. When in reality, the mistake was made in squandering, wasting the family resources. Hmm. 
Yeah, it's interesting to think about if if if, if he had been successful and had been a little more frugal, he might have been the hero of the story for a Western reader, right? <laughs> well, it's the story. What what I do with to go back to Joseph and the coat of many colors, because I don't pick up that it's actually a story about Jacob. Then I turn and because it all went without being said, Cody, uh, what happens is I fill in the details that are missing from my own background hmm. rather than from the background they would have had. What's so motivating what happened, Thomas, Thomas they have felt, right? Right. So I turned the Joseph story into the American success story, which is, you know, little farmer boy in Iowa. I hope you're not in Iowa. Anyway, little farmer boy in Iowa who has to leave the family farm, you know, not always for his own you know, it's his, his fault. And he goes to the big city, overcomes adversity, you know, and makes it big. Um, Ta-da! And then the family admires him. So for me, the story really ends with Joseph becoming second in command in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And what I fail to notice is that's halfway through the Joseph story. But for me, everything else after that is epilogue. You know, the sacks of grain and things hidden in the grain what you know it, i think i yeah what you know to me it ends with ta-da he's second in command he's the hero so that's the american success story when in reality the success was at the end when he takes care of his brothers mm. which is what he was supposed to have done at the beginning yeah that's interesting <laughs> yeah well I, I i had a question i wanted to ask but i think we've we've already maybe answered it a little bit by example <laughs> which is, you know, um, how is it that we, we can miss things in the story because of our individualistic culture? Um, and maybe, maybe kind of a follow-up on that is, in, in the book, you guys discuss uh, these three um, social structures and collectivist cultures um, that are really important to understanding what's happening in the text. And uh, as I recall, they're kinship, patronage, brokerage. Right. They are, they're not just really important, Cody, because as Americans, we we want to say that to kind of downgrade. They are, they are the elephants in the room. Mm -hmm. I would argue in every biblical story, at least one, mm -hmm. and often all three are in play. Wow. And usually they are not discussed because they went without being said. Sure, so sure. Uh, kinship, family lines. So the story of Joseph, we say the story of Joseph. The first time he gets in trouble with his brothers. One of my Middle Eastern friends said, where's Jacob? And I thought, well, this is not about Jacob anymore. That was, that was a ch last chapter. You know, I've already moved it on. It's, we have stories about Jacob in period, stories about Joseph. When they said, and his comment was, well, of course, brothers squabble. That's what brothers do. It's the father's job to make sure brothers do the right thing. Hmm. So they saw this as a story about Jacob's failures yeah and and part of that is the fall you know the yeah. effects of the fall of man so we it's a story about kinship and we turned it like I said into the American success story stories yes. about patronage this is often in play in we really see it a lot of New Testament stories in fact before we end I want to talk about some of the terms Paul uses describing our salvation in terms of patronage and then brokerage, mediation, you know, you have a mediator. So what's interesting, Cody, they consider these to be the th three, if not the only three, but certainly the, the big three or some of the big, biggest ones of their social values, things that go on, kinship, patronage, brokerage. And as individualists, we view all three negatively. Yeah. Kinship, we call nepotism. Hmm. Patronage, we, it's already a negative term. And then uh, brokerage, we, what do we want to do with the middleman? <laughs> middle 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 man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and um, someone listening, there's, you give a lot of good examples in the book to kind of help explain some of these things. But like the, the patronage system um, is, I think, as essential for life for a lot of people in, the, in collectivist cultures where, you know, we have this sort of rugged individualism. Everybody's kind of responsible for themselves. Um, which is good and bad. Like on the one hand, it's good that we've created a system where you can kind of do that, um, where it's not quite so self-reliant, where it's not quite so or quite so reliant on others and quite so dangerous or, or whatever. But ultimately in patronage, it's the idea that the people who are wealthy have some responsibility uh, for those who aren't. And those who aren't wealthy, they rely on others to take care of them. So they create these patron relationships 
uh, or they don't create them. They, they try to uh, get them going, I guess. And so we see like Paul has patrons that that's really important for his mission, right? Some of the- Well, um, the, let me uh, poke at you a little bit. Cody. Yeah. I would say patronage is essential for our salvation. Mm, okay. God is our patron. Yeah. Um, we don't earn salvation. It's just a gift to us. Hmm. So um, self-reliance is an American virtue and a biblical vice. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, and, and, and not just in our salvation, but thinking about like, you know, Psalms where, where they talk about God providing, right? You know, we, we, we think of God as we can't live or eat or, or have anything unless God first provides it. He opens his hand. And yeah. Provides. Yeah. Yeah. So that's patronage. And then brokerage, I, I think one of the best examples you use is Jesus as the broker or as the mediator, that when there's some, uh, if you get, in, let's say there's a need, or maybe you get into some kind of legal trouble, you have somebody who has some influence with the person you're in trouble with, or who can give you something you need, and they try to arrange that relationship. I think there's a story in the book about um, trying to audit a class. I don't know if that was a story you told or, yeah. or your, your co-writer. Uh, Rich, Rich actually told that one. But here's the interesting thing. I am in trouble with someone mm. and I need a mediator to fix it for me. I'm in trouble with God as judge and I need a mediator to fix it for me. Yeah. The problem is when Paul says there's one mediator between God and man, the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Um, well, that usually isn't in the pack of scripture verses that we learn. <laughs> so, <laughs> so one of the many reasons we have trouble with the book of Hebrews is uh, the book of Hebrews says, we have a mediator, a better mediator. And as Americans, we think, I don't need one. Hmm. Yeah. Well, but, but, but these three examples, kinship, patronage, brokerage, the way we should be thinking about this, for thinking about it from a New Testament lens, is that the church is our kin, God is our patron, and Christ is our broker. Yeah. And, and if you so, don't want to, yeah, go ahead. So the, 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 let me tell a story um, to help illustrate patronage, to help it understand. It's one of my favorite. I made it up. so. Obviously, I like it. So let's say Cody is a baker in the city of Philippi. And you're a baker because your dad was a baker and your granddad was a baker and your great-granddad was a baker. Well, one day, all the other bakers, you show up one day and your bakery is burned out. And they would say, Cody, you have offended um, the goddess of bakers. And she has struck you by burning down your bakery. Well, that and you didn't carefully put away the fire that night, the night before. But anyway, either way, your bakery is now in ashes. Well, you could go to a bank and get a loan. At the time of Jesus, the interest rate was about 11.5%. The problem is your collateral is in ashes. So you have nothing. You have nothing. So you, you know, I see your plight. I'm your buddy down the street. And uh, I say, wow. What are you going to do? And you say, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I'll say, I have a friend. By the way, the word friend in biblical times, particularly New Testament times, meant a lot of different things, but never buddy. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? So when they say we have a friend in Jesus, they don't mean we have a buddy. Um, really interesting. So I'll say, I have a friend who might be willing to help you. Well, what that really means is I have a patron. Hmm. So I go um, the next, every morning, all the clients are called, all the members underneath a patron. You show up at the patron's door every morning and you get in line based on status. And then when it's your turn, the patron may give you a little gift of something. You can tell him anything that you might need. And if he needs something from you, he'll ask. All right, so I get my turn and I say, um, to my friend, the patron, I have a friend, Cody, terrible misfortune has fallen upon him. His bakery is burnt out. Well, my patron is not obligated to help you in any way. He's not obligated. But for whatever reason, he decides, you know what, I, I am going to help Cody. So he'll give you some money to rebuild. He also has some clients who own lumber, some who make bricks, some who do things. And so he tells them, hey, I want you to help Cody rebuild his bakery. All right. So you rebuild it. At that point, you're now a friend of this guy. 
So from now on, when you bake bread, you bake bread for him and for all of his clients, and he'll make sure you get a fair price for your bread. Hmm. That makes sense. Now, the gift he gave you, they had a, an ancient word for it called charis. And it just means a gift, hmm. an undeserved gift. But in response, you are supposed to be loyal to this guy. You know, you now are part of his household, they'd call it. Um, and that word was called pistis. Now, the only time those two words are used together is in patronage. And Paul says, for by charis, grace, we have been saved through pistis, faith. Mm -hmm. Paul puts those two words together. And when he did, everybody would have said, oh, yeah, patronage. So salvation is God is our patron. We don't deserve the gift of being rescued. But as a response, what are we supposed to be? Loyal to him. That's the response God wants, faith, mm -hmm. loyalty. That we believe he's going to do what he's going to do, and we are loyal to him. So those things, Paul used two main metaphors that everybody understood to explain salvation. One was patronage, grace and faith. The other was adoption. Everybody understood how adoption worked. So those were everyday things he used to explain the mystery of salvation. And adoption is, is how we become kin with someone else. Right. They would adopt, like, if this guy liked you a lot, he might decide to adopt you. And then you're not just a client member of his household. You are a son in his household. Hmm. And uh, now the firstborn, so you don't replace the firstborn son, even if you're older than him. But you are now a son of this patron. If he would do something that crazy. Um, well, God has done. So, so those are some of the, the, the systems that we need to kind of understand what's going on in scripture. You also talk about social tools, and, and, and I wanted to maybe focus on one in particular, because it's one you talk about uh, a great deal in the book to kind of explain it for Western audiences, and that's the word shame. Right. And So uh, let me explain tools, what I mean by tools first, Cody. Mm -hmm. um, every culture has ways to teach values and to reinforce values to maintain values. So in my Western culture, I mean, I haven't written a book about this and I haven't really studied it. So I'm just speaking from experience, but some of the tools my culture uses are stories like um, the tortoise and the hare, Cinderella, um, the early bird gets the worm, the little red hen. Those kinds of stories teach American values and reinforce them. We'll even, sometimes somebody will quote, you know, um, you show up a little late at work and the boss will say, you know, hey, Cody, the early bird gets the worm. That's reinforcing an American value. Another way that we reinforce values is guilt. We will use guilt to teach value. My, my grandmother was a pro at this. So we will use guilt to teach and reinforce values. So every culture has tools. Mm -hmm. In collectivist cultures, um, some of the main tools are honor, shame, and boundaries. So um, that was, those are the three that I talked about. Yeah, and, and shame is one of those that I think in particular we, we don't much care for. We don't like the word. You know, I, I, in, in uh, some of these kind of uh, discussions about culture and, 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 you know, what kind of culture we want to be, there's a word you hear sometimes, slut shaming, right? And it has a negative connotation. You're sort of making uh, a negative assessment about someone's sexual activity, right? And right. That, so, uh, Cody, let me interrupt. The yeah. uh, I'll ask my students. I'll say, so is is it wrong to shame someone? They say, yeah. I said, no, come on. Is it always wrong? They'll say, yes, absolutely. I'll say, well, that's interesting because God shames people. Mm -hmm. Jesus shames people. Paul shames people. And they get kind of quiet. So let me first say, our culture in general doesn't use shame. When we do use it, it's the misuse of shame. Um, so the only examples most people can think of is shaming done wrong. Mm -hmm. And shaming done wrong is wrong. It's just wrong. People have been wounded. They have been deeply, deeply wounded by the misuse of shame. The problem is that's the only kind we know. So we don't know what to do with 
I mean, we didn't, we didn't even know there was such a thing as positive shame or positive shame. Yeah. Yeah. It, it seems to me that, and, and you can elaborate on this a little bit and you do in the book, um, that, um, you know, shame is a means of something, right? When you talk about a tool, you're, you're trying to do something with that tool. You're trying to produce something or, or create an effect. And it seems that in the West, we think of shame as a means to power, right? Right. We're trying oh, to sort of make somebody feel bad or put somebody down or elevate ourselves. So that's an interesting uh, illustration. The one I used um, is, you know, to be part of a group, you know, there's a group and some people are more in the center of the group. Some are more at the edge. But if you're part of our group, so shaming only works if you're one of us. Mm. So the idea is you're starting to do things that are moving you away from the group. And, and you're either in danger of crossing the boundary or you have crossed the boundary. And the goal of shaming is to pull you back in. It's to draw you in so that you stay part of we. Mm -hmm. it's, it's because you belong to us. Um, we only use shaming to push people away. Often yeah. they're not, we don't really think they're one of us anyway. And we want them to be even further away. So the quick, easy rule of thumb, is this a good use of shame or a bad use of shame? If the goal is to restore, to pull someone back in, you're thinking they are us. They belong with us. We love them and we want to, in a sense, save them from falling outside the edge. Yeah. And that would be the positive use of shame versus the negative shame, which good riddance. Yeah, yeah, I, I was going to say Michel Foucault might not see a distinction there, but Paul certainly does, right? When, when Paul sort of talks about, um, uh, you know, not eating with the person who's doing the horrible, sinful thing. And the, the goal is that your restoration is the ultimate goal, right? Right. But, um, but which in 1 Corinthians, he says, put the person out. You've tried all these other things. Put the person out. And then in 2 Corinthians 2, welcome them back because he has repented. Yeah. That was the goal is to restore. So I guess my question, though, is in light of the way we see shame and the fact that I think, I think we have a hard time when we read passages like like what, what you said Paul was saying or any kind of church discipline, because I think we, we think of it as something that's kind of more harmful or I guess my question is, is should we should we be applying these tools in our culture or would they would actually would it be negative? Would, would it be a bad idea for us to do it because the culture is not built that way? Well, we are doing a little bit of it. Um, and some of it is uh, positive. You know, back when we were all wearing masks, someone wasn't wearing a mask and you'd go, you know, kind of tug on yours and look at them. Yeah. And that was, that was a positive use of shame to try to say, hey, come on, let's, let's all, we're all in this together kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But one of the illustrations I used is shaming is a bit like a chainsaw. Mm. You can do in, you can do enormously good stuff with a chainsaw, but it's a it's a little bit of a dangerous tool to use. Mm -hmm. And there are some people I would not ever want to hand a chainsaw to. They're just reckless and careless, and the at best they're only going to hurt themselves, but they could hurt someone else too. Um, and so, in in some ways, there's a lot of folks who should not try to use any shaming at all. Yeah. Because it's, they're likely to inflict uh, harm. They're just going to do harm. But uh, we are abandoning a tool that has been used effectively. You know, Paul writes, I write this to shame you. So <laughs> he wants to make sure it's very clear what he's doing. I'm writing this to shame you. When um, Nicodemus comes to see Jesus and Jesus says, wow, you're a teacher of Israel. You don't know these things. That's some mild shaming. Hmm. Yeah, you know. there's there's an example that comes to mind. Shaming and and maybe shunning is, is kind of a form of shaming, right? Yeah. Um, and you sometimes hear stories about Christian parents who stop talking to their kids after they come out of the closet as gay, for example. Mm -hmm. And and almost every story I've heard of that is doesn't end well. It's it's always it's always destructive, I think, to the relationships. Right. Um, and so that's an example that I think of as a Westerner. I think of with shaming. Um, you know, we want, and I think that the parents' goal is what I think most Easterners' goal is, right? We're going to try to get you back in by pushing you out, right? By pushing you toward the edges. We're saying, if you're going to be this way, you're out. So you need to be the other way. Right. Right. And, and uh, 
one of the problems was shaming, just like guilting, mm. um, which is the American tool. Um, you can over apply it. You can apply it too harshly. It's a, you know, we, we're all fallen people and we're all sinful people and we don't. So um, all of us can also tell stories of a pastor who applied guilt too heavily mm. and ran people off. Well, that wasn't the goal. The goal was to bring them to awareness that they're not conforming to biblical standards. So um, the fact that a tool is misused does not invalidate the tool. But I would also say, if someone can't understand the nuances of either tool, guilting mm. or shaming, then they're better off not using either one. Yeah, they should just try, just try to show patience and compassion if they're, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, think, I think that's fair. Uh, one of the tools you mentioned, um, and it's it, you actually kind of brought it up as well when you're talking about what shame is about those boundaries, right? It is boundaries, right? And so when I think of boundaries, and this is me as an, uh, not just sort of an, an unintentional American individualist, but as somebody who's kind of an individualist libertarian, I think of boundaries um, like um, you know these nationalism and, and anti-immigration and racism and uh you know war and so I, don't fence me in yeah you know, we right. don't like boundaries yeah and, and so I, I think of boundaries in my head kind of generally as, as a negative thing right. but i also so and i think you know i think about how paul was writing to the church in galatia and he's saying you've created this boundary between jew and gentile or, or he makes it more clear in ephesians mm -hmm. um this wall and that's a bad thing. You need to take that down. Right. There is no Jew and Gentile in Christ, right? Right. He's arguing there's a different boundary, which is the it. community of Christ. Yeah. Yeah. So so Paul is not getting rid of boundaries completely, right? He, he's just saying we need to draw our boundary differently. Right. So I would say um, you can't have a group if, if you don't have a boundary. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, if church is like, the crowd at the mall there's no boundary and but there's no identity either um one of the worst things i heard one time was somebody saying we're offering services that multiple times we want to be like the multiplex mm -hmm. so they just whenever you show up there's a service well the thing is at a multiplex i don't want to get to know the person in the seat next to me sure i don't want to i don't want any community with the people who are in the movie theater with me i don't even really want them talking <laughs> um, well, that's that's the opposite of what church ought to be. So um, you don't have a group if you don't have boundaries. You don't have identity if you don't have uh, boundaries. So it's really fun to bash insider language. We'll say, oh, you know, a group, you know, you use insider language. Well, insider language is a wonderful tool to pull people tighter into a group. When you start sharing vocabulary and sharing expressions, it creates more identity. The problem is, if you're trying to reach an outsider, insider language can push people away. So you say, all right, the WPA group is meeting at Miss Alice's house on Thursday. Everybody's welcome. No, they're not. First off, you have to know what a WPA is, and then you have to know where Miss Alice lives. And oh, Okay, so that kind of group, that kind of saying is a bad use of insider language. Hmm. But one of the things we uh, start doing, even when you start discipling people, you start using certain phrases and terms, which inherently become insider language, but yeah. it's designed to start drawing people in closer. So both are very appropriate. And you're one of us. <laughs> yes. So yeah. you, and you don't talk this way. <laughs> mm. There's certain, certain vocabulary you need to get rid of because you are one of us. So all of that is, a, you just need to know who am I, talking with. If I'm trying to draw people in, I don't want to put barriers. If I've got people, but I don't want to starve the folks in my group because I'm always trying to use only outsider language. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't found a way to help people feel more a part of us. That's interesting. You know, there's, I think I, um, when I became a Christian, um, it was largely because I studied it out and it made sense to me. And so I thought that was how you were supposed to become a Christian. Um, and so when I would go to a church or something and they'd say, oh, invite your unsaved friends to church, I would think they don't know what this is. What, you know what I mean? They, they don't, this is, that's not going to be effective. And it turns out I was wrong because <laughs> when you invite people 
in if they sort of feel like this is a, a good place. I like the people. They're friendly and welcoming. They're drawn by wanting to be a part of the group. They're drawn in, right? Exactly. And even if they don't understand a lick of it, they want to be part of the group. <laughs> right? well, well, one of the things that frustrates me, because I teach at a college campus, Christian college, people will say, oh, it's part of, I'm at Palm Beach Atlantic. University. So we PBA, they'll say, oh, it's part of the PBA bubble. And they act like this is a special phrase for them. Mm -hmm. My last place I taught, OBU, they talk, oh, the OBU bubble. The place before that, WBC, they talk about the WBC bubble. That bubble is actually called Christian community and Christ died for it. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing. It's just when it's used to keep people out, it becomes bad. There's a misuse of any, anything good can be misused. Yeah, that's good. Um, well, we, we, we've talked, I had some more notes here on just kind of sure. comparing and distracting you from your question. Oh, no, it's, no, it's okay. I feel like we've covered some of this stuff though. So I didn't want to get too off track. I think part of like, I, I don't remember if I said this in the recording, but I'd sort of said on the one hand, I've sort of, you know, you talk about how as Westerners, we're sort of individualist by default. And it's something that I kind of picked for myself. I thought about it a lot. I did some reading. And at least politically speaking, I think of myself as an individualist. I see collectivism. I think of that like, like you know, Soviet Russia kind of stuff, right? But, but I also am a Christian, and I think that, you know, we're supposed to be in Christ. You talk about that boundary marker, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, that's, that's where, that's, that's the group, right? And I think of, um, there, there's often a misquote, and maybe it's not misquoted in, in the East the way it is in the West, um, where Jesus talks about, they'll know, they'll know you by your love, Right. And you often hear kind of more progressive people saying, progressive Christians saying, uh, you know, we're not, if we're not nice to outsiders, then we're not really showing the love of Christ. Now, I think that's true that we should be nice to outsiders, Absolutely. but that's, but that's not what Jesus was saying. He said, they shall know you by the love that you have for each other. And so that that's, right. it, it is an in-group thing, right? They're going right. to, and it's a you plural. They will know all of you yeah. by your plural love and, and going each back other. Yeah. And going back to that example of inviting, you know, your unsaved friends to church or whatever, the draw is not that you're super nice to outsiders, but that they see this familial relationship um, and they go, wow, I want to be a part of that. Right. right. They're drawn in by it. Um, so the, let me give an example of community. This is kind of fun. Um, I was uh, in Borneo talking to some uh, church elders and they said, is it is it true that if a boy and a girl like each other, they go out by themselves. Mm. I said, yes, we call it in, in English dating. And they said, wow, that's amazing. And I, I said, really? Why is that? They said, boy, if uh, these were diet people, if diet people did that, somebody ended up pregnant. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it is funny, their attitude, they didn't use this illustration because that's not the way they think, but it works. It illustrates what they mean. They think of it as, you know, if you put sodium and chloride together, you're going to get salt. Yeah. And it's not the fault of the sodium or the chloride. But what we do with American kids, the only defense we give them is self-control. You know, you have to exercise self-control when you're out on a date. Okay. Well, what I've noticed is uh, self-control works better the less you like someone. Mm. So I'll tell my students, maybe you should only date people you don't like. Mm. <laughs> and the funny thing is the closer people get to being married you know they're now engaged with the more we leave them alone and indonesians say oh that's the worst kind of thing to do because they really like each other at that point yeah. and uh and they said you know a a fiance with one e should have a hard time keeping his hands off a fiance with two e's mm. um you know and they think that's natural and normal and we think oh that you know, no, you should have self-control. Oh my goodness. And they say their attitude is it's our job as a community to protect them and to yeah. help them. So isn't that funny? And we say, oh no, this is where our individualism, well, it's up to those two. And they just individually need to exercise self-control. Well, my experience has been that's that's not always a great idea. Yeah, no, that, that's true. It's, it's, it's fascinating that the way the community sort of takes responsibility and says, you know, you'll thank us later. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Um, and when, they, uh, probably, they, they probably had, do. They had a, a girl in the church who had become pregnant outside of wedlock. And they said, you know, this was not right behavior. I said, okay. They said, but she belongs to us. Hmm. She is she is our daughter, meaning the church. And that baby belongs to us. 
that baby is our baby as a church. And so when it happened, they came around her and they said, we somehow failed to protect you the way that we should have, but we will help you raise this child as you should. Wow. Isn't yeah, that wonderful? It is. That is. Well, and, and you talked about social tools in the West. You mentioned guilt. The thing that came up in my mind, and maybe this is my, my pers- you know, we talk about bring our own perspectives, but my perspective as a libertarian, I think one of the main tools I see in the West is, is, is law, right? <laughs> and you look at an issue like abortion and our, our inclination is, well, let's start by treating it as a legal issue uh, in the West anyway, right? And it, but but I think what you're saying about where if the church was sort of saying you know we'll take care of you you don't have to worry about it I wonder if that would be a more effective solution to to to, to lower yeah. the number of abortions than a legal solution I think um, I love the way you said that uh, Cody because my think we tend to divide it into two options either you're allowed to have an abortion for any reason you want any time yeah. or all abortions are wrong. And I think as Christians, we should say, how can we reduce the number of abortions, as you said, for the good of the mom and the good of the child and the good of everybody? How can we reduce this number in ways that are caring and compassionate? Yeah. Well, to to maybe kind of to finish the thought I had earlier about um, this kind of individualist political tradition. I look at it, the, this tradition we have in the West of kind of free markets and individualism, and I think, you know, the, the stats don't lie. Look at extreme poverty, look at famine, look at death by natural disaster. All these things were so much better than we were. People don't necessarily have to have a patronage relationship to eat. You can get a job, you know, and I think of those things as good. But on the downside, though, we we have lost that familial kind of culture. Everybody's supposed to take care of themselves. That means when you can't, you don't have anybody who's there to come up with, come up and help you, right? Which right. if, and so I, my, my inclination is to say, even if the, even if our culture is individualist, even if our p- political situation is individualist, and maybe we say that's a good thing overall, I feel like the church can't be that way. We, we have to be a family, right? Absolutely. Um, free enterprise, capitalism is not exclusive. I mean, you can be a collectivist and do those things. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, we tend to think everything good in in American culture. And I I love this country. Um, It's because we're individualists. No, a lot of the stuff that's good in our culture is actually because we have a Christian heritage. Mm -hmm. Um, And so we we do want to take care of, of, of people. So I think, um, but it is a family uh, structure and offering at church is like the family, uh, the family treasury where everybody puts a little money in to help the family. Um, that's the purpose of the, of the offering. It's not, you know, I'm investing in this or, you know, and do I get a return on it and that sort of thing. It's family looking out for each other. That's good. Well, that would be a, a much better place to end than where I'm thinking about ending, which was with a tough question. Um, <laughs> Are we going to do it anyway? <laughs> maybe. Um, well, m- m- maybe uh, if, if we can do it briefly, let's do it. And, right. and, and that is, and maybe we can't, but um, that, you know, on the one hand, as individualists, we have trouble understanding scripture, but I think sometimes... Um, we read things that are sort of collectivist in scripture. And I think those are maybe sometimes our strongest ethical objections when we find, when we read stuff that we have trouble with. So like Israel making war against the Canaanites, driving them out of the land um, that the, the law of Moses allows uh, for, for to keep slaves for a certain period of time, because that's sort of necessary for the collective survival of the culture of the, of the people. Right. Uh, or this kind of collective punishment. Sometimes we see where, not everybody in Israel is bad or everybody in Judah is bad, but everybody sort of suffers together, right? And um, this seems to us, and maybe it's because we're individualists, maybe because we sort of feel like, you know, the, the punishment should fit the, the, the crime or whatever. Um, we think that that's unworthy of God. If God is this good God, he's going to treat everybody fairly. We, we sort of have this picture on Judgment Day of every individual having to answer their, for their individual sins, right? Right. And so what do we do with some of these collective sure. things? Uh, the, let me take a quick stab at it. First, um, we, uh, we actually like collectivism in some ways on this. 
that uh, on judgment day, I do not want justice. I do not want what's fair. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get what I deserve. I want mercy. Uh, <laughs> um, so I would, I want God to treat me because of Jesus. So I want to be part of his team and go in with him. Like in the parable of the uh, virgins with the olive oil, they, they, they don't have an invitation. That's why they're not allowed in. But if they enter in with the bridegroom, they get to go in as part of his group. Hmm. So that's how, why I want in. I want in because I'm with him, you know, is that kind of thing. Um, but uh, one of the reasons we struggle with this term is some of those stories like the Canaanite is actually an issue of language. When, you know, uh, Pharaoh says, throw all the, uh, the male children into the Nile River. Okay. By the way, Pharaoh wouldn't have said it that way. He would have said, sacrifice your male children to the Nile God. Um, but I love the way the Bible says it. You know, you're really just throwing them in the river is all you're doing. So, um, but uh, Moses doesn't lead a group of women out of Egypt. You know, Moses's brother Aaron is, so when he said, sacrifice the male children, well, ev evidently some were. Um, you know, uh, kill all the Canaanites. Well, there are Canaanites everywhere in the chapters that follow. <coughs> they'll say, kill everyone in the city, and then they'll talk about all the people living in the city. Hmm. Um, that is just their way of, of talking. So uh, part of it is... Um, we tend to read these things up. So, wow, they killed all the Canaanites. Well, no, apparently not. Um, and there was no uh, immigration laws and stuff when nobody was going to welcome the Israelites in. Um, when they start moving out of Egypt, uh, any place they go, they're going to be at war with those people. So it's a little bit of a different uh, scenario. I would say we live in better times. I think the reason we live in better times is because of the work of the Spirit for the last 2,000 years. I think as Christians, we are salt and light. We are leaven. We are making the world better as, as we're here in, in this lump of dough called the world. So to be able to look back and say, well, that was a lot worse than it is now, my response to that would be, yes, thank you, Holy Spirit, that we have been making a difference in the world. Wow. That, that's a good answer. Thank you, Randy, so much for your time. Uh, I love the, the books you've written, and I'm going to heartily recommend them and then link to them in the uh, show notes for anybody who's interested in them. And uh, I know you're on the road, so I really do appreciate you carving out time and a place to do sure. this. Thanks. Thanks, Cody. Thanks for inviting me.